Thanks for joining us today on AGL Live. We are going to discuss human-centered design today, and we have an excellent panel with us, including a few members from GoodGovUX, which is an organization that focuses on improving UX in government in a similar way that AGL focuses on bringing Agile to government. So I'd like to first invite our viewers to use the Q&A icon to ask questions of our panelists. Um, you can do this in the top right corner of your viewing window by clicking on the icon with the little boxes and then clicking on Q&A. And we'll start with some brief introductions. I'm Elizabeth Raley, Director of Professional Services at Civic Actions. I'm a practicing Scrum Master and also on the Steering Committee of AGL. And I will pass to Jesse. Oh, hi. Hi, uh, let's see. I'm Jesse Taggart. I'm currently leading the design and product strategies of the consulting arm of 18F. Um, which is housed inside General Services Administration of the federal government. Um, in short, what we're trying to do is, through a consultative manner, help uh, agencies and programs within agencies figure out what and why, what they should actually be, be building or problems they should be solving, um, hence probably why I'm here on the show today, but also how they do it, which is uh, links to my background working in agile software development, um, and who to do it, which relates to a whole acquisition um, procurement um, initiative that we also, and consulting services that we also offer. Great, let's go to Jason. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Stoner. I'm the director of the digital practice at MetroStar Systems. We, um, we're a federal contractor and really a lot of what I do is very similar to what Jesse mentioned, where we're really looking to build systems, websites, applications that connect with users and really engage with them to increase adoption. Um, you know, a little tidbit, I have a two and a half year old daughter now and I'm constantly fascinated every day by what she learns and how she plays around with different pieces of technology. And that really inspires me to create things that are easy for people to use. Thank you. Let's go to Norm. Hi everybody. Uh, I'm Norm Sun. I am from Excel Consulting. We're a small IT consulting firm based out of uh, Arlington, Virginia, and my goal is to improve the user experience across any digital products that we get involved in. Uh, and I serve also on the uh, executive committee for Good UX. Thank you. And Rob. Uh, I'm Robert L. Reed. I was a Presidential Innovation Fellow in 2013. I actually instigated 18F Consulting, which Jesse now works for, in July of 2014. Uh, in March, I uh, left service of the federal government, and I'm now trying to create some electronic stuff, as you can see. I'm the founder of Public Invention for All Humanity. Um, and uh, perhaps we should spend a little time explaining um, the difference between AGL, GoodGovUX, and, and 18F, and the way it works with um, contractors. Um, I'm sure many of the people in our audience will be contractors rather than people within the federal government, so it's worth a little time talking about that. Um, the mission of Agile government uh, leadership is to um, be a nexus or a connecting point for people trying to bring agile software methodologies to the federal government and to government at the state levels. Um, in fact, in our previous shows, we actually had the governments of New South Wales and Australia on talking about agile there. And I would remind everybody that um, we would love to answer your questions if you chat them in. And after the show, you can visit our YouTube channel where all of the previous shows are available as well. Um, Norm, would you like to give a little plug to GoodGovUX and uh, perhaps explain its mission? Certainly. Uh, so GoodGovUX, our mission is to drive the adoption of a common set of UX best practices within the government agency and the surrounding government uh, contracting communities. Uh, right now we have three teams that are working together uh, and they each have their own mission um, to create the best practices and assets to share with the federal government. Uh, those three teams are in the areas of terminology and definitions, RFP and proposal language, and deliverables and best practices. Um, we've been going pretty strong all of 2015, and we're looking forward to having our next showcase event on Monday, October 19th at the National Endowment for Arts. Great. Thank you. Um, and so, Jesse, would you like to explain um, to our viewers uh, how... 18F Consulting works with federal agencies and how it's different than a commercial consulting firm. 
Sure, sure. Um, and I'm going to uh, speak super briefly of this HNF overall, um, and then consulting, which is a, a, a portion within that, you know. Um, but basically, I'm going to riff on, if you go to our website, we still have the phrase, delivery is the strategy. Um, and HNF has been, you know, this, it was seemed and started off as an experiment inside the federal government maybe a year and a half ago, plus or minus some months on how you do the math on that. Um, Delivery is a strategy. Um, we've kind of started to interpret that in like deeper ways as we understand more of how to do that inside the government. Um, so it's anything from like we have cross-functional, typical agile design uh, developer, product manager teams that will go in and work with agencies to help them execute on something either in flight or they're about to start. Um, and then the consulting part of it is uh, trying to work with projects, different stages. We may be, look at a project that's like that's in flight and needs some help. Um, from an acquisition point of view or a design review point of view, that sort of thing to make to help them know that they're working well with their vendors and also helping make sure the vendors are working with a good client. I have empathy on both sides of the relationship, having come from both sides of that. Um, and then also working with acquisition strategies of how one might procure, if I can use government terminology, um, an agile vendor to continue to use the, the, the terminology. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but just like in brief, that's where, where we're at. Um, well, and we're also we're also all over the United States. I'm usually in San Francisco. There's a huge number of us in D.C. Um, and we work on a distributed uh, philosophy um, and model. I happen to be in D.C. right now. But. Well, thank thank you very much. So um, perhaps we should point out that I used to work for the federal government, but now I'm an independent consultant. So in a way, I'm a vendor as Elizabeth, Jason, and Norm are vendors. So in a way, they're on the opposite side of of the fence. But 18F Consulting is designed to help people or help the federal agencies do a good job hiring vendors. Uh, so in a sense, we're all uh, cooperating on these things. So let's dive right into human-centered design. Um, uh, we, there are a lot of things we can talk about uh, first, but um, Jesse, why don't you just try to explain what human-centered design means to you? Thank you, and I appreciate the to you part because to represent like this huge field <laughs> in this like would be, would be a little bit daunting. Um, to boil it down, and I often do this to help to then like boil it down to the simplest things and then build up in complexity as needed, but basically I would like to say that like human-centered design in a sense is like a, a common sense that all of us can have access to and there are different tools and traditions that it come from. Um, as a practice that will involve sociology, ethnology, anthropology, uh, visual design studies, that sort of thing. But I mean, but in essence, like the main thing is to build the systems that you know in the machines so that the humans can use them, right? And understanding that humans are are motivated by like goals, attitudes, needs. If you don't understand what those goals, attitudes, and needs really are from a primary point of view, um, you increase the risk of building something. In, in an, and I'm going to do that in an agile way, possibly building it very well. Um, but what you build might not be right, the, the right solution. So that's it in an incredible nutshell. Well, that's right. And like all great truths, it's fairly simple but still hard to live by. Um, witness a lot of federal government websites, which appear not to have been designed taking any notion of humans' desires and goals into account at all. Um, and we'll um, return to that subject in a bit, I'm sure. Um, Jason, why don't you uh, talk about what human-centered design means to you? Well, I think uh, Jesse did a great job really boiling it down to the essence of it. Um, but it's really making sure that whatever it is we build is usable by people. At the end of it, it doesn't matter if it's a website, if it's a car, if it's a mobile app, or if it's um, a water fountain or a door. Uh, you know, I'm sure we've all had troubles where, you know, do we push or do we pull on the door and we open it the wrong way. You know, Human-centered design goes into that. And it's making sure that the way we build it, there are signifiers, there's affordances, there's things that connect with how people interpret what that object is. So if we want to build something that connects with people, we need to make sure we get feedback. We need to make sure we build things in a manner where um, they can comment on it. And they say, well, no, is that a handle or is that a doorknob or whatever it is? So to me, it's really just a way to make sure that what we build connects and is usable, and there's an enjoyment factor to it. Thank you. So I see we have quite a few viewers right now. I'd like to remind the viewers that you can chat in questions to um, our panelists here. Um, and I'd like to point out that um, 
I know many of our viewers uh, are probably thinking, well, this is the most obvious thing in the world. Of course you should take uh, the human being into account. But it's also the case that, um, for whatever reason, governments have not done a good job doing that in the past. Um, so I think we need to talk about specific design techniques, um, even though they may be obvious to some people, for producing a good human-centered design. Um, Jesse, would you like to talk about some of your favorite techniques for ensuring that a user interface uh, is a good user interface? Uh, yes, <laughs> um, and I, I want to preface it with a 30 second like bigger picture space because it's actually just something that that's in the last two weeks keeps coming up to me which is and it ties a little bit to like working inside the government really intensely and intimately with different agencies and groups, which is, you know, human-centered or user-centered, and I use those terms interchangeably, user-centered design, we typically think is like for like the consumer or the or in the government space, the general public, right? The general public often being a challenge of a term because it's so general, how can you design for everyone? How do we, and how do we address that, right? But I'm also, you know, in the government context, there's so many systems, you know, the government is in the business of approving things or disapproving things, things for good reason, good reason, good reason, good reason. Yes, yeah. yes. Jesse, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Is anyone else hearing that? I think Sorry. just plug and replug. Okay. When you and, and actually, it sounds good now. When you're not speaking, perhaps we need to mute our microphones, please. So those of us who are not speaking could mute. Yeah, it happens. You start over. Okay. Right. Yeah, I got a, I got a hundred and one tricks up my sleeve for video digital problems if they happen. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to say, like, besides the general public and the types of public who may identify on the outside, there's also the folks inside the government whose job it is to, like, handle processing of applications or their permissions. And that's an audience I'm also, like, doing a lot of, like, education that we should be building for as well because they, they aren't, to do their job, they need to be able to do it in, a, like, a hum human-centered or empathetic way as well. And then the last thing is um, this idea of occasionally throwing this term around recently, like, agency-centric. And I'm thinking of this like when Congress passes a law, you know, how might, and this is just a forward thinking thing, but like how might that be researched or written so that an agency can best implement it? Right now they, they drop down and like thou shalt do it by then. You know, I'm curious, like, you know, I'm not saying tomorrow, but like how that thinking might inform the idea of like centered design, you know, human centered, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then quickly, because I want to pass this on to other folks, there's a lot of known things. Um, one of the thing, tools I use a lot, like one-on-one -on -one interviews or contextual inquiry, um, and not, and I usually I tend to avoid focus groups. I tend to avoid wide surveys. If I use a wide survey, it's to start my research in a certain way. Um, and one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, ideally in a quote-unquote ethnographic study, where you're actually in the office. I'm thinking now of like government workers. I've been doing a lot of like government enterprise research, and in their office, shadowing them um, and how they do their job to see the actual connect connect points of my product, the technology needs to how it fits into their work, um, and the stuff that's often different than the assumptions running out there. Um, so everything, I mean, Rob, you said earlier you, you had assumptions about like who you thought the audience dialing in today were, and I wanted to be like, well, how do we know that? And how can we find out? And that sort of thing. So I'll pass it on to other folks too. So I have a specific question, but why don't we let just Jason um, give his take on that before we get into specifics? Sure. Um, you know, for me, it's really understanding the environment and the audience that you're targeting, that you're um, kind of building for, and as well as the agency, because um, every agency is different, every user, um, every audience is different. So you really need to have a, a toolbox that you can pull from, and um, when you get into actually doing something, you need to be able to pull from it on the fly because. You never know what's going to come up. Um, and like Jesse said, uh, there's a range of um, um, when it comes to the various techniques that you use. So if you do focus groups or uh, surveys or things like that, you're going to get more qualitative data and information. It's generalized. Um, the more you get into one-on-one -on -one information, it's quantitative. And um, you know we do things like um, even heuristic analysis, but card sorting, um, A-B testing, game storming, um, trying to think of a couple other ones, but task flow analysis, 
So, Jason, um, yeah. let, me, let me interrupt because um, those techniques are pretty important, and I'm not sure all of our viewers know exactly what they are, although, of course, okay. they can look them up. Could you just give us a one- or two-sentence explanation of um, game storming and sort card sorting and some of the other techniques that you mentioned? Sure. So with card sorting, um, you, let's say you have a website and there's um, you're redesigning a website. Uh, you want to make sure that the labels that are used in the navigation um, to organize the information make sense to the people that are going to use it. So you use card sorting for people to organize um, the various cards into categories that make sense for them. Or they can even come up with their own labels and terminology. Um, a lot of, and I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent, but a lot of government websites are really built around organizational structures of the agency. And it's more of um, building them for the way people want to use the websites. So by using card sorting, you can see how the navigation and structure of the site would appeal or um, connect with um, actual users. Right. I mean, one, one thing that I think is an important motto is that the user is not the boss, right? The user is not the person who is paying for the website. It's the person who is, actually has to use it. And card sorting is a mechanism for getting feedback from the user about what they need, not what, for example, the organizational structure of some agency is. Um, so thank you. And, and uh, I have a number of other questions. And we have some questions from the audience that I'm going to get to in just a minute. But uh, could you tell me what game storming is? I don't think I've actually heard that term. Unmute yourself first. I got a nice little pop-up uh, from Google as well saying unmute yourself. Oh. Um, and we kind of um, we combine things a little bit. Um, so we combine game storming a little bit with um, using uh, dot voting and things like that. But um, you know, maybe I'll make it a little more broad. And uh, what we look to do is really um, use techniques that make it fun and engaging for people. So if we go through a lot of um, you know, the more drier things, uh, it's not really fun. It's more like work. So we look to introduce different techniques and design studio, design thinking is another one. But with game storming, you look to make it interesting for the users and you make it interactive where you're getting their ideas, you're getting their feedback. So you're drawing ideas out on post-it notes and you're posting it up on the wall and then people can vote on it and then you take whoever votes on it the most and you start to narrow it down that way. Um, so it's just a way to get people to contribute to it in a fun and interactive way. Okay, thank you. Jesse, go yeah. ahead, Jesse. Yeah, can I just do a, add on a quick like a, a yes and, which is, which is also a technique, right? So mm -hmm. that when you brainstorm, you don't shut people down, yes and. Um, and it's like a little H&M plug for the design team at H&M, which is recently launched um, the V1 of uh, method cards of all, like and in a card form, if you go to methods, uh, hnf.gsa.gov is uh, all sorts of cards about four by six inches and you could also view online of all these some of these methods and when you would use them in the discovery um, in the usability testing state of a product and that's sort of, I mean and the other people have made these cards too but it's something that we're also trying to put in a government context um, I would encourage anyone to look at it because we've also vetted them for PRA paperwork reduction act um, uh, conflicts as well so you can know what you can use and this is those are for anyone I should I yes? put like an 800 number up or something. <laughs> I do a yes and. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Jesse, uh, could you please just explain uh, what the yes and technique is? And then also you've taught me a little bit about um, the uh, JK exercise, I believe it's called. Maybe you could explain what those are to our viewers. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, yes yeah. and is just a simple, uh, you know, it's just a simple way of keeping a conversation. It comes from like improv as well, right? If anyone's done like improv workshops, and like I am holding a cup of milk, and they're like, "No, you're not." It's like, well, then how do you keep going with the thing that you're exploring? And so it's just often used like with a group talking, like how do you build on people's ideas um, and not shut not shut them down because you just don't know where where they're gonna go with that. Um, K and J method. Uh, as a huge shout out to Jared Spool has a fantastic long uh, 
detailed article of how to do that, and we sum it up in one of the cards. I haven't done it in a while, but the main thing is like, and this is actually great in a government setting, is when you have a lot of stakeholders in a room to make a decision, you know, sometimes people of higher, higher hierarchy or whatever will like over talk and control the room, and it's a method, method, methodological way that allows people of any role, and whether you're extroverted or introverted, quiet talker, to using post-its on a wall and dot voting in, in an organized way get to the decisions, either a decision or what question to even pursue deeper. I mean, that's it in, in a nutshell, and there's a way to do that. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I'd like to point out, just at a very basic level, all of these techniques involve getting physically present with the users and trying to make things tactile, trying to use little cards or some kind of physical or colorful way of getting people more engaged. Um, and now we have a challenging question from the audience. Uh, Gerardo Gonzalez asks, it is my belief that Agile methodologies do not address user human-centered design directly. I would love to hear where the panelists see the connection points and how Agile and human-centered design help one another. Um, I happen to have extremely strong opinions about this, but since I'm uh, acting as a moderator right now, I'll ask Jason to go first, and, and then I'll correct him. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so for us, we, we run an Agile shop at MetroStar, and um, with that, you know, in true Agile, um, I guess even let me back up a little bit. What we do is we really look at trying to have the UX team about two sprints ahead of the development team. And in between there, we have design about one sprint ahead of development. That, and whatever, whatever methodology you follow, um, you know, people do Agile UX, there could be Lean UX in there. That's kind of a different conversation. But we look to really have people working ahead, so then by the time it gets to development, it's not too far ahead. There's still collaboration, there's still teams uh, working on a team basis where they're making decisions together and they're validating things, but then nobody's waiting on each other. So that's how we handle it from an Agile perspective. Um, you know, from the human-centered design perspective, it's really just another component that's put in there um, for how design and UX work together to ensure that the strategy is in line with the goals of the client and needs of the users. Uh, Jesse, would you like to talk about that? I mean, just just like a brief a brief thing. I mean, because Jason like you know basically nailed it, right? Uh, but is uh, gosh, there's me a couple of flavors of this. I mean, one is that like agile. I mean, sometimes and we parse words around here because some people like the definition of agile includes you know being user centered. Um, but you know, I think traditionally it's been separated out, and I think because HCD can come with like some heavier methods, and you, you you sure as heck you know need a sprint zero if I can call it that. And sometimes that's been there, it might be three months, sometimes it's two weeks. Um, I think in an agile in an agile way, I'll often say, like, you know, and I had this with a, a client uh, a couple months ago, and they're like, do we need to do, like, a year of user research? And I'm like, well, that would be fascinating, but no. Like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, how about three months? How about, you know, I'm like, if it's really bad and, you know, or really tight, you know, like, in two weeks, I could find some insights for you if I'm given, you know, you know access to primary, primary users. So I have a lot to say about that. Um, Norm, do you have anything to add before I mention some things? I would say no. And I think uh, Jesse and Jason have summarized it pretty well. I, I would say that uh, for us, when we design, we, we kind of put our design on a separate track. So it's working in sprints as well. Uh, well, we're like maybe two to four sprints ahead, and that way we have that flexibility to make adjustments into the design and usability test on those things before developers get to them and so that they're ready to go. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. So if we boil this down, you know, people can argue, as Jesse just pointed out, about whether you should be one sprint ahead or ten sprints ahead, and perhaps it depends on the nature of the problem that you're solving. You know, I think a real master of this, someone who is very experienced, will have a feel for how far ahead they should get. Um, I know Jesse and I have sometimes um, discussed this very issue and tried to figure out what the right amount to be ahead is. The danger 
with having programmers jump in and start coding immediately, which is my instinct as a programmer, is to immediately create an MVP as quickly as possible, is that you set the user expectation in a bad sort of track, right? And then you start modifying something that's going completely in the wrong direction because you didn't do enough user research to figure out the right direction in the first place. On the other hand, doing a year of user research is clearly crazy in a world where technology changes so much in two years that it's unrecognizable. So you clearly need to somehow find a, a midpoint there. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, I hope that answered your question. And uh, maybe some view if it didn't, viewers can correct us and ask us some other things. Um, I have another uh, question from Tim Nolan, who is a uh, county government agent uh, here in the state of Texas. Um, he writes, how do you engage the user citizen when building an application or a service as a government agency? Um, that's kind of an interesting question, right? Uh, uh, because as Jesse has mentioned, the Paperwork Reduction Act several times, which in, at least in theory and at least on the surface can make it hard to interact with actual citizens when you're a government agency. Um, Jesse, why don't you address that? How do you get the actual end user in the room where you can ask these questions? Sure, sure. I'm going to answer and then I'm going to make a joke and be like, I wish I could do a phone a friend on this. Um, so the answer, because a lot of my work actually since coming to ATNF for the last 13 months has been actually with a lot of, I could call it a government enterprise, and it's a layer of the user is actually the person who works inside the government. They may have to, you know, process a case workload or something. So I've had a, a relatively, you know, if I can be so bold, like unfettered access to the user base in my research. Um, we have groups in our, in, in our research team at 18 f that have been specifically focused on PRA and the conversations and, and helping with like true interpretations of the law so that they can do user research, um, that they can put screeners on public websites and get those groups um, and speak to them and do t t uh, traditional user usability testing or user interviews. So that's a lot of work we're still going. I have a lot of empathy for vendors um, who are also trying to figure that out because there's mixed ruling and, and I'm actually really hoping that like ATF can help like charter that from, from our space inside the government to help with the, the, the interpretations of those rules and then communicating them. And I can speak to this as well. I, I worked on a project with the San Francisco Human Services Agency um, to build a site that was about healthy eating and targeting it towards people who were collecting government benefits. And we just walked right into the government agency where people were waiting you know, in line to get called up to the counter and said, hey, do you want to talk to us? And had that one-on-one -on -one interaction, showed them the site, showed them logos. We got a lot of great feedback that way, just having that connection. Uh, that's right. And I think we should all realize that you build tremendous respect and knowledge if you sort of do your homework and go to where people live. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, going out with an investigator for the Department of Labor um, actually out into the field on a real investigation to learn how they use a computer system that we were trying to revamp at that time. And doing that had the, the great advantage that it made the client believe that I was very serious about trying to understand the user needs. Um, and that's a, a similar example. So thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Um, Jesse, you mentioned one-on-one -on -one interviews, and I, I would like to delve a little further into that. Um, you know, we live in a world uh, ever since uh, Robert S. McNamara tried to run the Vietnam War based on body count statistics. You know, we've kind of lived in a world where people think things aren't true if they can't be measured, and they try to reduce everything to statistics. And I believe statistics are extremely valuable, but I have found that early in a process, one-on-one -on -one interviews are far more valuable than attempting to design a survey. Um, and so I wonder what you think about that and how you manage to, well, and, and how you perform one-on-one -on -one user interviews. Sure, I mean, yeah, and I will answer it. And I just want to give like a, a two-second nod to Jason and we're curious about like how, and to here to help, like how we can help in a sense, but um, how it is doing user research 
um, as a contractor for the for the government. Um, I want to answer Rob's question, but maybe I can pass it to you after I, I do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, okay. So like, I mean, like, so one on one on one interviews in a nutshell, like. Um, a couple of things. One, I tend to avoid focus groups. Focus groups, you know, there's a joke that it's it's research of how people present themselves to each other in front of their peers versus anything else. A lot self-reporting is an amazing thing. Um, and also, like, it's it's easy if someone asks you, do you like that? I'm like, sure. You know, or if I want to complain about something, I can. It doesn't cost me anything, right? Um, so one-on-one interviews, um, and again, ideally linked with some sort of observation. Um, is a lot of understanding the motivations besides beha- besides that first layer um, of, of activities. Um, so it, it's gonna it's gonna be interviewing about people's tasks, asking them what a typical day is. Sometimes, if it's a longer study, you might do something called diary studies um, over time, which is which you know requires some effort on that end. But um, so it's it's some of their self-reporting, but 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 phrasing the question so it doesn't go into the answer that you're that you you know you're not no no leading questions for sure. Um, and you know, a rule of thumb is like if someone says something well, like, well, why is that, and why is that, and you keep going up a level, and you do, I don't know, three, seven, twelve interviews. It kind of depends on how you're doing your research. Um, you start to get patterns of those motivations, and then from those motivations, they are like tool agnostic, right? You get a motiv- you get a sense of the needs, um, and from that, you might either get I'm going to use the word personas in a light way, or certain ar- archetypes, as sometimes I like to slice it. Um, and you're going to get a sense, a collection of goals and needs that these folks have that you could build on. And then the second thing out of those interviews is sometimes a sense of like working design principles or project principles. And project like involves everyone so that you can help make decisions moving forward from from that. So, and then I'm kind of curious, Jason, about about that issue, about that the challenge out there. Yeah. For us, uh, because we really work across a broad range of clients. We've encountered pretty much every scenario possible, where we have some clients that are very open and you know give us access to do whatever we need to do. Then there's the exact opposite, where why do you need to talk to people? You can't talk to people, and then it's really trying to educate them because we look at this as a partnership um, as to why it's necessary. And we have been thrown the whole Paperwork Reduction Act wild card a couple of times. And we've had, we have had to go through that a couple of times. But typically after we explain what it is we're looking to do and why it doesn't really fit into um, the Paperwork Reduction Act, they, um, they kind of give us some leeway with it. Um, but I know we just had this encounter recently where they said that we needed to submit all our questions up front and it was going to be vetted and it would be, um, I believe, like three months. And we were saying, well, we don't know all the questions. We're going to ask general questions. And then from there, you know, they're just to get the conversation started. So, you know, one of this thing, one of um, the things is as, as HCD, UCD expands and is more common within government, I think it'll get easier. And we've noticed that. So now there's kind of the learning curve of trying to educate um, the differences of asking questions and the meaning behind it and what we're looking to get out of it. It's not a burden, and it's meant to really help government and citizens. Thank you very much. So I'd like to remind our viewers that we're happy to accept your questions, and your questions are probably more interesting than the ones that, that we designed ahead of time. So um, go ahead and chat in your questions if you if you have any. Um, I would like to um, talk about that. Um, a, a former Presidential Innovation Fellow, Clay Johnson, um, recently was on uh, the podcast Reply All, talking about just how bad government websites are. Um, and Jason's discussion of government, HCD and UCD becoming more common in government raises some really interesting questions. Uh, why are we talking about HCD now, and why weren't we talking about it 10 years ago? Uh, is this a relatively new technology that people are just now figuring out? I mean, I, I think it has been better articulated in the last 10 years, but it, I mean, I don't think 10 years ago people were like, let's ignore the user as much as possible when they design things, but they still managed to build very, very bad websites, at least in a government context. Um, so 
Jason, Norm, Elizabeth, you guys are contractors, and Jesse works within the government. I would really like to get some idea of what you think the landscape of human-centered design is. You know, is it changing? Is it going to get better? Or is, or is this just that we're someone having this conversation 10 years ago and it made no difference then either? So, uh, Jason, I'll ask you first, and then you hand it over to someone else, please. Sure. Um, I would say it is changing. Uh, if you look at career paths like uh, human factors engineering, it's hot. And because people understand that you need to have this understanding of how users work with the systems. Um, and it even goes a step further where it's not just about interacting with uh, the website in front of you. Let's say you're building an application for government. There's distractions involved. So if a coworker comes up to you and says, hey, Jason, can you look at this? Well, how long does it take for me to refocus on the task that I'm doing? So being able to understand the environment around you, I think, is becoming a lot more prevalent. And it's a factor in how we're building um, the different applications and systems that we're building. Uh, when I got into the technology field, I came from uh, uh, branding and marketing background. So I was used to doing market research, getting input from uh, users or customers. So when I came into the technology field, it was kind of a natural um, uh, path uh, for me to start asking the same types of questions, even without knowing this idea of user-centered design. And then um, we ran into lots of uh, um, pushback from various clients because at the time, the term wasn't known. And it was, like I mentioned earlier, where, well, why do you need to talk to users? Because it can be scary. Because they're going to tell us there's something wrong. And we don't, want, we don't want to know what's wrong. Just go fix it. Like, well, we can't fix it if we don't know what the problem is or how they're going to use it. Um, but through partnership, through education, and uh, common terminology, um, like, uh, like uh, Jesse was saying with uh, the method cards, they build a common language. And between those three things, that's helping to um, educate uh, various people, even if they're not experts in UX or user-centered design, they hear the buzzwords and are like, oh, I want to know more about it. And it's not as scary as it used to be. So let me interrupt before I turn it over to Jesse yeah. and um, point out that um, this feeds into a question from the audience specifically directed to Jesse. Um, could you elaborate on how you educated your clients on the importance of user interviews? Um, so perhaps, Jesse, you could talk about this idea that the users or the agencies have to be brave, which um, Jason sort of raised. Sure, sure thing. That's a great, whoever sent the question, great segue to so that I wanted to like, raise up here. Um, but with a pre quick preface to your, the history part of your question, I can do this succinctly, I swear. Um, you know how like, there's a saying out there, uh, Mark Andreessen was like, software is eating the world, you know? And I would pause it, and not in like the pretty light sense, but like design, soon after that is design is eating the world. Or I would pause it, content strategy is eating the world, if we're going to do this. Um, but and I, I vaguely remember reading a brief, like a history of like why now, right? Like why so much human-centered design, blah, blah, blah. Um, and part of it is because software is eating the world and we're dealing with interfaces more and it used to be more in the past that, you know, I, w I would use a book. You know, you just, there's that image of the desk of all the things of the desk that is now on your smartphone, right? And because of like the explosion of interface design, we are at, at abeyance to that, like a thousand times more than previous modes of, of interacting. I mean, you could, you know, I, I, industrial design has always existed, but the, 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 the pain points have like magnetized, magnetized, in mag grown in magnitude um, be because of that. Um, and then to answer your, the other question, um, which I'm starting to forget, is, oh, how, how do I convince about, like, about user-centered design or one-on-one -on -one interviews and that sort of thing? One is, and you'd, you'd started this off, Rob, talking about, you know, that there's the paying customer or the government, you know, in our context, that like the government is like the paying client um, and not the end user. You know, their employees may be the end user who then provide value to the public or the direct public may be the user. And one of the things that I found working with, with et private enterprise clients and also the government is like, like, 
doing user research and in, in throughout the process as well, but is, is like a huge risk mitigator. It can save money. It can be. It can help them make decisions with all their conflicting stakeholders because if they rally around a common set of needs and goals that their audience needs to have met, um, it's it's like a it's like the neutral driving force for them to make decisions moving forward. Um, I've done a lot of things of like with in and Jason, you mentioned this about language. I mean, we have a large agency I worked with last winter, um, and I still feel like one of the major wins from that was to have like the program leader of this huge project, huge project, un finally understood. Like he knew it should be about the users. He was there with that with the with the culture, but he didn't know like some of the how or the language, and just to know the difference between user research and user experience design. Because you can do all the research you want, but if you can't synthesize it into the rectangle in that instance, um, it doesn't go anywhere, right? So that's well, that's one of the things. Again, yeah, common language and really bringing to the point the value and how it can create a neutral decision-making tool moving forward. So, so Jesse, I know I'm a little unfair in that I sometimes ask three questions at, at one time, um, but let, let me come back to something that Jason uh, mentioned and uh, Sohn from the audience asked, and I know you have some experience with. Um, it is sometimes hard to convince people in the government that they need to talk to users, and it is sometimes scary. For example, Clay Johnson said um, really hurtful things to the people who built this website, which is admittedly terrible, and the people who had built it know that it's terrible, but it's still not easy to hear from the user that the system you have right now is is so awful that it's unusable. Um, so of course people run from that. Um, how, Jesse, do you get people in the government to face up to it? I, I, um, I mean, as you're saying this, like I'm having this reaction because I'm like, yes, if people react negatively, that's feedback. Great, that is feedback, and it's really valuable feedback. And in mass, when you think of like large-scale issues that have happened, like that, that quantitative thing is just like, okay, this is a triage thing. We need to we need to fix this and move forward, especially with what's at stake. But in like like other projects that might have like a less less critical thing going on, like if you have negative feedback, I mean, we do a thing, you know, be like particip like participatory design. It's like, okay, you have negative feedback. Join me, you know, in a room with a Sharpie and let's let's sketch it out together. We were just doing this earlier today in a workshop I just finished with one of our stakeholders. Um, and it gives them a sense of agency to express themselves and in, in a meta meta sense build some empathy for them about the design processes. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a question from the audience that I'd like to dispense with quickly because it's a little technical, but before we get to that, Elizabeth or Norm, do you guys have anything to say about that very important subject of how to be brave in collecting user feedback? I, I mean, I can just add that we just have to do it, and as vendors, we have to say it's important, and we, we have to push it forward. Okay, good job. Uh, okay, so we have a question from uh, a different person, different Jesse, Jesse at work. Uh, Jesse at work writes, have any of the panelists worked on a project in which more than one jurisdiction partnered to create? For example, two cities that share a border decide to partner to reduce costs. If yes, were there any challenges you faced in executing a user-centered statement of work? Um, and that, that's a very interesting question, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, uh, Jesse, why don't you take this first? And for all I know, Norm and Jason may have as much knowledge as you do about it. Yeah, I, I have a quick one. I have a quick one, and it's not going to be geo... Well, I guess it is geospatial, but not about a physical s space. That makes any sense. Um, but it was, it was a, large, a large agency last winter that, that I was working on, and they were building a system that was to address every, a system that needed to be modernized in every single state, right? And that question was, is how do you meet every single state's... And they had grouped up to maybe like seven or eight states tended to do things in a certain way. Um, and this was a, a challenge because the project had proceeded many years before we got involved, um, where they had tried to, you know, done a thing called requirements gathering, which is... I would say human sense of design tries to uh, not do that in the, in the traditional way that that happens because there's a certain prioritization that doesn't happen when that happens. So 
So can yeah. you explain what traditionally is done in requirements gathering and why you avoid that? I mean, the word sounds like a good thing to do, but when yeah. government does requirements gathering, it gets a little weird. Perhaps you yeah. could discuss that a little. Yeah, I can discuss it, but I want to, I want to pass it to Jason because he might be getting more of this in some of his projects. If you want, if you want to take this, I'm happy to pass it to you and not talk. <laughs> so. um, yeah, I can uh, I can take a crack at it. Um, you know, when it when it comes to requirements gathering, it really, you know, it, when you look at the Agile process, you don't know all the requirements up front. So, by, you know, trying to define everything up front is pretty complicated, and you're going to learn thing is, things as you go. So it's trying to define what the outcome is that you're looking for and approach it that way. Um, we created a mobile app for... Um, all the counties in Georgia uh, to be able to view bills and legislation and things like that and uh, there's a lot of um, you know there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stakeholders in that so one of the things that we did is we really tried to uh, streamline the feedback so there was kind of one person that was providing feedback consolidated feedback to us and then the other thing is making sure that creating some type of prototype for them to interact with. Uh, we found that people don't know what it is they want until they touch it, till they feel it. So the sooner we got to that, the sooner we, we were able to get to tangible feedback. And then we were able to have our direct client consolidate the feedback and prioritize it because we had a lot of stakeholders, but we had one paying customer. So we need to make sure that we aligned uh, with them while meeting the user's needs. And by following kind of that process, we were able to get through a lot of um, evolutions or iterations of it quickly um, and easily to get to something that they really like. But it's really just focusing on the outcomes, not the requirements, and then you add requirements as you go. OK, thank you very much. Um, can, so, I, can, I, can I say, can I interrupt one really quick clarification? Sure. Which is a, which is a total yes and here. Um, which is, I want to say, like, requirements in the context that you're probably using it, Jason, is like lowercase r, and the capital R requirements is old school waterfall of, like, 3,000 items on a spreadsheet that have been not prioritized that then in a contract is dumped on your desk and you're supposed to execute. Um, and we're trying to change that overall from all right. angles. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, I think you could say if... If you're dealing with long list of contractual like requirements rather than overriding principles, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, and I, I would like to come back to um, the question of minimum viable products or MVPs, which Jason raised. But I don't believe we've answered Jesse's question extremely well. Let me reiterate that, and maybe we can't answer it in the show. But let me just mention it. Not you, Jesse. The Jesse who called in. Um, let me just repeat. He asked if yes, that is multiple jurisdictions, were there any challenges you faced in executing a user-centered statement of work? And can anybody field that question? Are there any challenges in uh, executing a user-centered statement of work? Um, so I would say really from exercising the user-centered statement of work, it's really looking at um, the amount of people that you need to speak with to get um, the necessary feedback and input. So because you're dealing with multiple areas, there's going to be travel involved. So you need to you need to budget for travel. You need to budget. Um, you need to figure out how you're going to get all these people into different areas if you're going to talk to them. So with that, it's really looking through the strategy of how you're going to create the statement of work and um, look to how you're going to get people to give you the feedback you need and then how you're going to provide them um, the MVPs or whatever it is your, um, your deliverables are going to be. Uh, so it's, I would say it's really focusing on that. Um, you know, I can't really give any exact tangible um, anything else besides that? Yeah, well, that's okay. Sometimes you can't answer every question. Yeah. We're sorry, uh, Jesse. Um, I do think it's an, a very... Important principle, however, if you are writing a statement of work and you don't have stuff in your budget 
for getting in the same room with a user one way or another. Elizabeth went to the stand in line with people. I went out to the field of a landscaping firm. You know, w w whatever it is you have to do to get to the users, you're making a mistake. And it's better to put money in the budget for travel or whatever you need to do to get physically in front of users where you can do this research to do human-centered design than not. Um, so now I'd like to segue into another topic, which might be our last topic before we close here. Um, Jason talked a lot about minimum viable products or MVPs as they're um, uh, talked about here. If you read the literature, on human-centered or user-centered design. For example, the work from the firm IDEO, I-D-E-O, which has um, published a great deal about this, or the Wikipedia article on human-centered design. They both talk a lot about MVPs. But the vague question is, exactly when should you present an MVP? I think there's a feeling that it shouldn't be done too early, and it definitely shouldn't be done too late. Um, and since Jason was just speaking, um, let me throw it either to Norm or Jesse. Uh, how do you use MVPs, and how do you like to have those done? Uh, my short answer is that it has to be an agreement between the designers, the stakeholders, the executive stakeholders, uh, and developers. I mean, each each party has a different con concept of what the MVP is. Um, maybe the developers say, like, it's functional, it's good to go, and the designers will say, or the experience designers will say, well, it has to have certain emphasis in this product before we go and launch. Uh, and we obviously have to meet the, the obligations of the executive stakeholders and what they're looking for in this MVP. But, but Norm, let me propose a, a hypothetical. So I code very quickly, mm -hmm. and I like to code very quickly. Some people would say I'm very sloppy, which is also true. Would, is it good to put a fast, sloppy prototype in front of people very quickly, or is that in fact a negative thing? It's a good question. Um, Jesse looks like she wants to answer it. If you don't, <laughs> something to say no. I'll let Jesse take that one. Are you take sure? I, I don't. Do not let my body language take over the conversation here. Um, but did, seriously, I don't want to interrupt you. Did you want to go? Because I can wait. Uh, no, I, I'm just saying it's it's just an agreement between the developers and designers. They have different opinions and perspectives, and it's just for my project, it's been that agreement on what we want to put in front of those people. And then I will yes and, uh, which is like sometimes it's like a, an MVP for who, right? Because we've had moments where we will we'll scrap together and put together a, a, a prototype or proof of concept, an MVP like that end of the MVP-ness of it, so to speak, um, because in the, what I've been discovering, like, is in the government context, is a lot of, like, enthusiastic, frustrated, you know, civil servants, program managers that the tools they have, because of, like, the long procurement process, the tools they have are, like, reports, like, paragraphs with bullets, right? Um, and by putting some sort of MVP, they get a visualization and a touch and feel of, like, where something might go, and there's a huge value for that. Um, if I'm working with a team that that's not that is like very mature and has loads of software experience, our MVP goal is going to be much more of a clearly strategic, like you know, you know, like the the mental model, like the shoe, the, the skateboard, the bike, the car, the plane, depending on what you need to get there. Um, it might it'll be more strategic related to that. Um, and then the other thing to think about is. Like, is it an MVP for, like, a greenfield project that's not urgent? Or did something just, like, you know, explode or not work really well and you need to fix it and you need to figure out what MVP-ness of that, if I can overuse that term, but, like, what's the main thing to fix first, right? That, that's right. And I, I, I think, you know, um, both the design process is iterative, as, as Norm suggested earlier, and the development process is iterative. And I think we're now perhaps entering a phase where someone should write a book that explains the judgment needed to know how quickly you should proceed in both of those things. Because it's always going to depend on the specific circumstances. It's always going to require a certain amount of experience to know that. You can't just have a cookie cutter approach to it. Um, in my opinion. Okay, we've only got six minutes left. Uh, if anyone is biting their tongue in the audience, go ahead and uh, send in your question now. 
Um, I would remind our viewers that after the show, it, it takes about 20 minutes usually, the video will be available at our YouTube channel, and if you see, think one of your associates might enjoy watching the show, you can send them a link or mention the YouTube channel, which we are trying to promote. Um, we would also like to thank GoodGovUX for providing these panelists and uh, point out that if you are a practitioner who is more focused on user experience than agile software development, you might want to look into GoodGovUX and potentially join or associate with that uh, organization. So saying that, um, let me just uh, let our panelists have just one minute each to summarize the advice they would give to a young person starting their career who is either a civil servant working in government, not necessarily the federal government, or, uh, or a contractor uh, trying to do that to promote human-centered design. Um, Jason, why don't you go first? No pressure there. Um, let's see. If, wow, this needs to be very uh, philosophical and deep. But um, you know, the advice I would give is, one, it's not something to be afraid of. It's, um, it's definitely something that is not easy. Uh, basically, if you look at a uh, human-centered design process, it's, um, it's really all there. You can take it. You can follow it. It's very tangible. But like anything, the devil's in the details. And it's really about how do you connect with the users and then what is that end output that you're creating, um, which is really the end, um, the presentation of what it is we're doing. So I'd say, learn all you can about the process. Um, don't expect it to be easy, but you need to ask the hard questions and do what's right. Thank you. Cool. I, I feel like I'm on the not last night's debate, but I'm like writing down my answers on the paper for like to continue the, the points here. Um, a couple things. One is it depends like where you work, right? And I'm 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 going with the persona that you presented or the audience you presented us, the assumption of the audience, right, Rob? Is so say say that that is that case. Um, go find if if you're in a private agency, you know, go find an agency where like you know human centered design and agile working together is supported. Um, some a quick. I mean, this is a whole other topic, right? Like uh, indicators like do you get client facing time or are you at the bottom? Of a feedback change, like those are those are some like tells of like what type of opportunities for growth and, and advocacy and representation you'll have. Um, if you're inside the government, and I've worked some folks like you're, there's enough team and they have they have support already, right? Um, but if you're, I've also met designers that are completely solo and they're way at the end of the feedback chain, um, and it would be to try to find inside or outside of government the right sort of communities to help them figure out how to either build it inside where they are or to find the group where they can do that. Um, and then the third minor thing is for anyone, um, and this is this comes from my experience. We were working with my peers here at ATNF, and we're in the agile development firms I worked before here. Um, is as a designer, like work with your developer, and not just as the person who's going to pick up the story in your backlog, but as a colleague he, who's going to give you insight in ways you can't imagine. And if you're going out and doing user research ahead of a project. Um, if you're doing usability testing, bring them with you and opportunities because their insight and their questions and vice versa um, and some of the things has is, is been invaluable um, in my experience so far. Thank you very much. Uh, Norm? Yeah, I'll summarize it very quickly. Um, my battery is going down to 1% here. <laughs> uh, I would say get involved with your community, um, whether it's in your federal practice, whether it's outside in your design community. Um, just go out there and, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Find a mentor, get started somewhere. Everybody starts somewhere and everybody comes from all kinds of different perspectives and that's why we make this a awesome group of people. Um, and if you're inside, especially finding someone that it will sponsor you, someone who will look out for you and speak for you when you don't have the opportunity to have that voice, that would be tremendously helpful in getting decisions made. Thank you very much, Norm. Elizabeth? I would just add it's an opportunity that there's a need for it right now and we talked about you know why were websites not you know thinking about this 10 years ago because we didn't have people like you so you know it was engineers building something from top to bottom and now there's space for designers so there it's I just see it as a tremendous opportunity read everything you can get the knowledge okay thank you um, thanks everybody um, I hope you guys uh, 
like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this after the show. Thanks for our viewers for calling in. Uh, hope we answered your questions adequately. I really appreciate our guest. I think this was a great show. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go off the air now unless anyone has a last-minute question. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.